Good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, fourth uh, Tech Talk. My name is Tom Avermaat and it's a pleasure to introduce you to this uh, Tech Talk. In these Tech Talks, we are exploring the character of tested knowledge, but also the modi operandi of tested knowledge in the field of architecture. And today our speaker in the Tech Talks will be Paul Vermeule, and the response will be provided by John O'Bennett, one of the PhD candidates in the Tech project. But let me first introduce uh, Paul Vermeule. Paul Vermeule is a partner in the Ghent-based firm of the Smith Vermeule Architecte, and is also a prolific architectural writer. He was a professor of architectural criticism at the Catholic University Leuven, a design studio mentor at KU Leuven, at TU Delft, and a lecturer and visiting critic in architecture schools in Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, the UK, Ireland, Germany, and Switzerland. In 2011, Paul Vermeule was awarded the biannual award of the Flemish community for architecture for his incisive writing and architectural criticism. And in 2018, he was appointed professor at TU Delft for the chair of urban architecture. The Smith Vermeule architects work in a multitude of fields and scales, ranging from interior to urban design and policy support with highlights on renewal and collaboration with artists. Many of their projects have been awarded and they also have been published widely. The office holds that it looks beyond the confines of the project. It's, it believes in, a, in the slogan, architecture is bottom-up urbanism and pays special attention to the long term. For the Smith Vermeule, building must be sustainable. In respect to the topic of tacit knowledge, it is important to realize that the city plays a very important role in the oeuvre of the Smet Vermeule architects. The, on the one hand, this means that the work of the Smet Vermeule architects is often inspired by everyday urban phenomena that at first sight do not seem to be very particular. As Paul Vermeule himself once said, we want to upgrade the ordinary in such a way that it is no longer trivial. This raises, of course, a question if and how tested knowledge is embedded in the everyday, in the everyday, in every, in everyday urbanism, we could say. The architecture of the cities for the Smet and Vermeule also a collective venture. Vermeule emphasizes that the link with other architects and actors is at least as important as the internal synergy within his own firm. He maintains that because the city is such a shared idea, Interventions in the city done by architects and urban planners should also be taught in the same vein that is considered, discussed, and designed together with others. And also here, of course, we could ask the question, what role does tacit knowledge play in this collective venture of the city? We hope to hear more about this in the lecture of today, and I'm now offering the floor to Paul Vermeule. So please, Paul, take uh, the digital platform. Um, I hope you can see my desktop now. Can you? Not yet. So, but now you should. Yes. Is this okay? Um, well then, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And thank you for uh, your introduction, Tom. Um, Actually, in the lecture, my, uh, in the lecture uh, properly speaking, I am not going to ask uh, that many questions. Uh, I'm just going to present the office and I and the work of the office. And so I asked myself, uh, well, what should that be? Some of the older work should be included. Some of the work that we are doing right now. Uh, some projects, some projects that have not been built um, and a variety of scales uh, should be included. So that is what I will try to do tonight. And I just prepared a thick slideshow for you. So I have to see how I can move. Ah, yes. 
So the first section is called uh, 10 Bridges. And uh, this is actually one project that started with uh, five bridges, five existing bridges. The bridges are railway underpasses designed by Louis Cloquet in uh, Ghent, uh, just before World War I. Uh, because at uh, that uh, particular moment, the railway, um, the railway was uh, replaced from where it was before to a new site that was uh, meant to be uh, a fair site for a world exhibition, 1913. And this led to uh, a dike on which the rails were placed and quite the right set of uh, underpasses underneath it, and it was uh, it was uh, clear that uh, Cloquet himself considered it as a sort of city wall, a city wall, uh, a new city wall with uh, uh, all gates uh, of them uh, in them um, that were the underpasses. So they were all very. Uh, very precisely designed as architectural features, as you can see here with the uh, Taluts hills uh, um, built against them to uh, support uh, the bridges themselves. But all of them were too uh, small. They had to be extended. That is what we did. We made extensions on both sides, which makes up for 10 bridges. So since, um, since all of the spans of these bridges were different and all of the structural types, as you could see, uh, were different as well, we wanted to come up with a sort of uh, flexible uh, concept that could suit all of them. Because we thought if we would make uh, different bridges for all of these uh, bridges that are in themselves already different, that would end up in a total, a total mess. So let's do uh, one design that is flexible enough to fit them all. And this is what we did. Instead of making stiff uh, bridge extensions, we made them, uh, we made them uh, chain-like so that they could uh, hang over and, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, fit the bridges on either side. So relationships could be, for instance, like this between the old and the new bridges. And the purpose of the bridges can be told from this slide. They are surface bridges. They are not meant for the general uh, audience, uh, but for service uh, staff of the railway company, and also to pass by in a safe way uh, cables. Uh, that are in the floor of these bridges. So this is how the old and the new interact. The new bridges are quite, uh, quite transparent because, uh, because for uh, hanging bridges, suspended bridges, uh, uh, very few material is needed. So you can see the old bridge through and well, since there are uh, a set of uh, one, two, three, four, five bridges uh, repaired or extended on both uh, sides, um, with actually every time the same design, um, the differences between the urban fabric on the city center side and on the peripheral side becomes clear and also from the station where density is larger uh, up to the outskirts where it is less large. So this would end up uh, like this. So I simply show you all of them on one and the other side. We are moving to the outskirts, other side as well. This one and then back again. So the diversity of the bridges and 
uh, the and the likeliness is um, is equally shown in the in the project. Okay, the second section uh, is called uh, three positions. The three positions are positions on urban design, and they contain uh, glimpses of uh, a variety of projects that all try to make uh, clear one uh, position on urban design. The first position I had in mind uh, is called uh, resumptions. Uh, the idea that uh, before you start, half of the project is already there because there are plot divisions that you can stick to, or that you are supposed to stick to. Building resources are found on the site. Uh, there is a program or uh, occasions for program, containers that could contain program, types are there, forms are there. There are contingencies to work with. And there are, of course, inhabitants and users. Uh, sometimes they are there that bring their lives with them. So the plot division was, for instance, uh, key in this project and all the project in Cotre that we did, where we wanted to uh, introduce new social housing in, a, in the interior of a building block that was uh, fully filled. And what I'm going to show you is over here. You can see the old plot division with a square building here, replaced by this one by our design, and an alley over here, replaced by us in quite the same plot division. Uh, acting like this was uh, strategically wise because it allowed us to uh, start the project before all of it was already uh, purchased by the client. And in the end, when uh, the whole uh, factory that you could see uh, ended by being uh, demolished, the, well, the parts that you could see before are over here, uh, fitted into a new uh, assembly. Uh, giving the same sort of geometry that you could guess from the older plot division, but with newer buildings. The chimney, that was the only thing that was seen of this old factory from the outside, was kept as a sign, as a statue. Or in this other project, more recent, we uh, also thought that the division of the plots of this semi industrial uh, fabric could uh, help us to develop it in uh, according to the principles of uh, slow urbanism, not first uh, tearing everything down and then develop from new, but uh, keeping in mind that some of these buildings could still play a role in the new design as a sports uh, facility, as maybe um, a startup center over here or maybe over there, or an indoor urban, uh, urban, uh, urban uh, sports uh, area over there. Maybe not all of them should be kept, but the design is flexible enough to absorb any of them if uh, the decision to keep them would be taken. Those buildings were resources, of course, that were found on the site. And that is the same idea in this project uh, in central Ghent, where an, uh, an existing uh, tower building, a brutalist tower building, a concrete tower, uh, was to be kept. The, uh, the setup of the project that we made with our team, uh, Jan de Velde, and EVR were also with it. The setup that we then had was that maybe uh, more could be kept, not just the tower, but also this uh, blind uh, bunker building, as it was called. Because we thought if a building with a facade, with a facade like this is considered industrial heritage, then maybe one with 
a facade like this also should be considered industrial heritage and be worth consider, uh, considered worth to keep. So we, um, we set out for a, um, a detailed cutting of the existing structures to give them uh, more space, more air. The orange uh, parts, as you can see, to end up with a setup like this. The tower more slim, uh, uh, L-shaped now, uh, more slim to make it fit in the uh, building lines along the Schelde River and keeping more space to heal the city fabric over here. And then the bunker building the, with the blind facades cut into two uh, loft facilities that would be more, uh, more uh, special, more rewarding than the normal development that you would uh, expect. A view uh, from uh, in between the repairing of the fabric and the large tower, the church bell tower in the end, far north, or the view along the river Scheld with the cutout of the bunker building uh, changed into um, lofts and with some of these concrete facade panels reused as a canopy on the nearby square. Or in Antwerp, still uh, things, uh, more things to be found on the site. But in this uh, half developed 19th century uh, area near to a dock destined to uh, not to be a dock anymore, we found a fabric, a rough fabric, rough city fabric that we could work with. And we found uh, slaughterhouse halls that we thought would be the guarantee that the project brief, that some uh, working areas should be included in the development would really be met. So this is the design that we made uh, with buildings blocks that echo the scale of the ones that are already uh, set in place. The cafes, restaurants, that uh, where you could eat uh, great steaks, really great steaks, enormous steaks actually, uh, in this place, that were uh, suffering from the demise of the uh, slaughterhouse could be the center, actually, the new center of uh, the area, uh, uh, echoed, mirrored by new buildings on the other side of the square, of, uh, it is true, a larger scale, larger plots, but also uh, exists uh, an, an urban uh, facade existing of many plots, similar to the ones over here. So we could uh, revitalize what was left of the urban energy uh, in here in the response with the new design, as these uh, sketches make clear. And moreover, the slaughterhouse halls themselves, which are actually uh, fantastic uh, structures, could be used for uh, other program than the housing, as is uh, uh, shown in the sketch over here. Lives of inhabitants and users. Sometimes they are very well uh, represented in project briefs. Sometimes they are not, and it seems as if they were forgotten about them. And then you simply have to get, have to go out and ask, uh, uh, ask about their lives and try to get acquainted with what their interest in the project area could be. The second position of tree on urban design is on streets. 
we love streets and we think that streets are maybe the common denominator of all the, the sorts of uh, uh, urban design that we have been uh, involved in. We take streets as a very uh, low profile uh, definition. It's a chain of addresses and uh, a device that allows you to go on public ground from one uh, uh, area in the city to the next one and therefore uh, cutting across uh, different uh, areas, different uh, lives of uh, city uh, areas. So like in this uh, slaughterhouse uh, area that I just explained to you, uh, we have been making building blocks or a sort of rationalized version of what we found uh, on the site themselves. But the real interest of our, uh, of our design was in to make streets. Car based right now, this is a political issue. But if you have the street, it could be used for other uses as well later on when we uh, get uh, rid of our car addiction. Or oh, this uh, design where we were faced with a master plan asking for buildings perpendicular on this uh, boulevard over here, where we tried to interpret the perpendicular scheme in such a way that uh, streets in between them would uh, alternate with garden areas, as you can see over here. And then with more public areas, like here, streets actually that would connect with the existing streets. So even if this piece of fabric would be quite different from what in this existing piece of fabric uh, was done, you could connect with them through streets through making uh, connections in the street pattern. This is a project that we are current, uh, currently working on in Ghent, uh, New Ghent. This is the existing situation. You see uh, a, a big road over here, then a loop that was organized back and fro, sorry, back and fro to that uh, uh, road uh, to the city center and on that loop the uh, buildings have been organized to uh, in a CM uh, matter all of the buildings on the same orientation high rises on this side low rises on this side so uh, we had to make uh, a plan for the area where the six where six of these uh, towers were to be replaced. That was the first question to us, should they be replaced? For technical reasons, the answer was yes. But we first had to make up our minds on what this site really was. And we thought it had a good site about them. That was the park to the left in the image. And uh, what it was not doing well was making a street because the buildings, the high, the high rises, really didn't, uh, didn't seem to realize there was a street in front of them. So the new design that we came up after a while uh, was still keeping towers, the one with the dots are high, same height as the towers that we were bound to keep. The towers are uh, actually smaller, only half the size of what they were before. So fewer people would use the same front door to enter the tower. And the addresses would be made continuous with these anti-chambers uh, and uh, anticipating entering the park and with the streets themselves. So we tried to provide a sort of uh, urban form that would connect the park with the streets in a continuous gesture with the 
um, with these uh, in-between antichambres for the park as prior elements. So instead of only one scale, different scales, uh, 12 stories, six stories, four stories on the street. This is a view of one of these antichambres, for instance, it could be over here. And this would be the other view out of the park, for instance, over here. Then this here could be this and that, with a communal garden in between, opening up to the park, properly speaking. And the antichambre to enter the park would be over here, with the addresses of towers and low-rise buildings uh, giving on to it. Other part of the project is to try to make uh, public spaces on the main road to Ghent that I showed you, the one where the loop would start, right there. There are a few uh, buildings there for communal use, like uh, a church, which is actually quite an interesting building. And you could say, well, all the open space around the church, all of that is a square, but actually it looks more like residual spaces, which are then uh, used for parking and nothing else. So what we try to do is make less uh, square meters of public area by building on it, like here or there, but thereby uh, giving more focus, giving more shape to the public domain and dividing it into different areas. Like the building you see here is exactly this one, uh, shaping a green park-like square over here uh, to the back of the, sorry, to the back of um, the church actually and in response to the school building, which is this one, another uh, square is uh, um, suggested by the adding of this new building. So squares where there was only residual uh, space. And then this idea of uh, streets in various forms is what I would like to uh, show in uh, a large built project that we have been working on for several years in Antwerp left bank. So if you look from the mass in Antwerp, this is what you would see. Uh, of left bank, you would see a collection of uh, high rises in some sort of pattern. And the surprise then, when you look to the uh, street plan of this, is that the high rises that you just uh, saw are actually uh, very much uh, uh, clinging to the grid of the street pattern that is established, which is a remarkable thing. So remarkable that we thought that it should be enhanced because the system of streets that, uh, that the low rise areas and the high rise areas share, have in common, could become a common denominator for the whole uh, project. And this is actually what we did. The low rises, the photograph that you just saw was over here, the low rise enters the high rise chamber like this. So the street that divided both areas becomes less important. A new street that is in the middle of the high rises becomes more important. By doing so, uh, a whole a new experience of uh, layering in the urban scene is uh, introduced. You see buildings of various scales 
sliding in front of each other and making what was before a very univocal uh, scene into a complex and a layered one uh, using also uh, uh, gardens uh, for that purpose. There were large park areas in big quantities on the site, but smaller green spaces, gardens that would immediately relate and immediately be uh, accessible from the buildings that was still missing. And so we did both. We restored the parks, restructured them, cleaned them up and added buildings that would introduce a very different scale of greenery of green spaces as well. Some pictures of that. And the new street introduced in the middle of the high rise would be the place where all of the addresses uh, really were. So it really became some sort of street. We worked on it with uh, various architects. So this building by the Vail de Vink Tailleur uh, adds to the street with uh, a piece of arcade colonnade. We responded to it with a street corner on a place where you would not have expected to see corners. And from the more dense area, zooming out, the street becomes a park uh, element coming nearer again in the other direction. This would be what you see. And then from the other side, like this, coming nearer. The building over here as a kindergarten designed by us. These buildings were by the Verde Vintage. Street scene near the kindergarten. And the side streets as well. Uh, with uh, an alternation of entrances and uh, gardens, front gardens. The third po uh, position on urban design that I would like to explain is that the architectural program can be a generator of urban form. So this point is worth making because uh, we are expected to do only uh, polyvalent buildings. Every building, it is thought, uh, should be, uh, should be uh, able to become uh, any other building. So all programs should fit in the same buildings. So the building you see here on the screen is a very polyvalent uh, building, but where we thought that the original program that it was made for, which is a police station, should be inscripted in the architecture as a sort of uh, feature that would stay with the building for as long as it could. And that would, even if it was not a police station anymore, still would keep the memory of a sort of urban activity that has been uh, uh, housed in it uh, in earlier days as not a neutral but uh, an outspoken presence on this urban square. Similar idea for this building that uh, first was built before the rest of its context was uh, teared down. So the building site was made after demolition of this. So this building, which was the older community health center uh, was kept in place while the new building was built. And after uh, moving into it, the building was, the older building was removed in order that this building took the scene and made, and that was what it was all about, made the gate in between the square over here and the newly made park over there. So the program of this community health center was very much uh, a generator of the urban form because we made the entrance area and 
the waiting area for the doctors, we made them, uh, we gave them a look onto the park. So to make sure that social control was achieved on the, on the, on the park over here, while the more discreet functions, which are the main ones in uh, a building for doctors and for medical care, are uh, transformed into some sort of more formal facade that makes the square. Same idea program as a generator of urban form for the left bank project that I just talked about. It ended up to become uh, an urban design project, but that was not the brief. The brief was about uh, public uh, amenities for this area. And it was only by studying these amenities that we thought that they could uh, be instrumental in rejuvenating the urban uh, design, the urban uh, relationships in that area by making on that main street that I talked about uh, many addresses where the canteen of the elderly home and the hairdressers that were on there before you even entered the building itself with the housing would be would have its addresses, a social restaurant, and then the housing above it as well. And here to the right, the kindergarten. This is the same image, but then uh, after having built it, two of the buildings, uh, and well, as a form, and then a form uh, originated by an urban program that is then taken over by people uh, filling it in. The form in the kindergarten and then how it is uh, filled with people. So the place itself is a buggy parking, as you can see. Oh, the patios and the units, uh, first as a form, as an architectural form, and then taking over by the kids in it. Okay, these were the three positions. The two churches, that's, uh, these are two projects that we are working on currently, right now. One is in uh, Ghent, in an urban area, where the problem in our mind was that uh, a situation that's, that was wholly totally actual uh, in the urban design as well as in the church interior uh, should become uh, oriented into a different manner to connect both the square and the garden, park-like garden on the other side. So this is actually what we have been trying to do with making a section through the church that would communicate on the one hand with the square, on the other with the park, which involved big openings of the church facades on either the square over here or on the garden. And these openings would allow to look through so that from the garden over here, you could see what happens on the square and vice versa. The, um, the covered areas, outdoor areas, communicating with the park over here, and then the interior areas, making good use of the great colorful floorings that they have, or uh, with the introduction of a new floor, the space above, which has a different relation to the uh, site, uh, uh, site uh, areas of the church. This is actually the section of this, as you can imagine. So instead of um, a one, one room that is 
totally directed into the choir, where, of course, religion wants your attention to be. We make it into a place with several rooms connecting to outdoor rooms, as this plan clearly shows. The second church is not in a city, is in a village, quite a nice village actually, Camel, in uh, the south of uh, West Flanders. And uh, it's a different story. Also, this church has to become uh, a community center, but the budget is, as you can expect, a lot smaller. So to do big interventions in the urban uh, domain or in the out uh, in the outside uh, perimeter, in the facades of the church, was actually out of the question. So the type of church is different. It is a, a hall church, as this is called, with three bays, all with their uh, own roofs. And this is the starting out for the project. We considered that uh, one of these bays, this one, would become sort of a foyer, while the two bays, uh, the two uh, other bays gathered with uh, some pillars removed, could become uh, rooms for activities. A high room with large activities or smaller rooms in two uh, floors above each other. With again, the idea that this would become not just a monofunctional building with a set, but much more a set of rooms. That could look like this with on the left hand side, the foyer, which is very much alike, like we can see the, uh, the church right now. And then the two bays gathered into uh, one big room, uh, joined with the smaller room over there or more uh, kept separate from it, as in this picture. So this is the section showing you this idea, with then a leftover space here, the choir, which is not uh, needed in the communal area, but that could become uh, a silent area connected to the graveyard that is still present around the church and that could be entered separately and be a space for um, contemplation, for silence, and for uh, other than uh, festive occasions. The last thing I will show you is only one house. It is uh, a house for a photographer so if you would think that it looks like a camera that is intentional, the other feature of the site was that it was that it had uh, trees, trees that grow there by themselves because it is a leftover plot in what used to be a village and now is a, a, a peripheral area of uh, Ghent. Many trees there and that explains for the a uh, composite form of the house that is uh, carefully uh, fitted in between the trees. You can see on the picture that the trees were, uh, were taken care of, that they were uh, kept uh, in good shape during the works themselves. Sometimes the trees are very close to the house and you can look through the house and see more trees, or in this bedroom above, you feel as if you were in a tree house, actually. The different doors are first for the photo studio, which is over here, higher than the rest of the house, then for bikes, and then finally for entering the house itself. All of them connected on one path uh, through the tree-like uh, garden. Um, the 
volumes themselves are made slender and light by very thin, sometimes cantilevering uh, canopies to them, uh, roof trims actually, that pass on the water of rain from the highest to the lower and then to again a lower roof. Uh, the rooms inside the house seem uh, not totally defined by walls but more by objects like it like a staircase over here or uh, a stove uh, or a kitchen buffet over there. Maybe the picture gives this idea more clearly. Transparencies between those uh, objects, between the staircase and then the stove, and then opening onto different views, different snapshots of uh, the garden around, or the buffet acting in much the same way. So it's not structure itself that uh, structures the space, but these uh, isolated objects in them, which delivers, which makes up for very uh, uh, wide views on, which actually is a very rich uh, environment. And then finally, the studio with a staircase that can be covered if you uh, take up the, well, the, uh, I don't know how this, how to say this in English, but I think you understand how this can work. Uh, colors, the colors of the doors are repeated in the bathroom. We have two bathrooms actually, a lower one, which is vertical, and a horizontal one, which is blue. So, pictures of the house between the others, between the other houses. And I uh, end with uh, a question that we recently got from uh, Niall Hophouse of Drawing Matter who sent mailings to various architects, asking them uh, where a design, with what a design should begin, where to begin. We offered him four answers. This was the first, with everything at once. With relationships between it all. With expanding the scope. Or with noticing more. These were our answers and this was the lecture. Thank you. Paul van Merle, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think for a very compelling uh, lecture that you gave, which is not only a sort of cross-section through your work, but I, I also feel a sort of cross-section through architecture, taking us from the city, city and infrastructures to the to the small details of the house, and even taking us to the to the architectural design process. Let's say where to begin um, at the end. I'm going to ask that our respondent is also activating his uh, video and uh, his uh, microphone because our respondent, as I said in the beginning, is uh, John O'Bennett. And John O'Bennett is the co-founder of One to One Agency of Engagement, a design-led uh, social enterprise in uh, Johannesburg. Um, One to One was initiated in 2010. There we have John. Welcome, uh, John O'Bennett. Um, so One to One was initiated in 2010 um, in support of the multi-scale work being done to redevelop post-apartheid South African cities in the face, of course, of the systemic inequality that they've uh, faced. Um, in his practice, uh, John is combining his practice in one-to-one -one with also more academic uh, work in the Faculty of Design, Art and Architecture at the, at the University of uh, Johannesburg, which of course also allows him to be in contact in, with, a, with a broader network of uh, international scholars and architects and designers. And last but not least, of course, Jono is now uh, one of the candidates in the, uh, in the TAC uh, project. 
and in that sense, uh, I think very well placed to ask uh, a few questions concerning the fascinating lecture that we saw before. So, Jono, please uh, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, Tom, and thank you very much, Paul, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I've been I've been working through the online um, experience of your work this last uh, few weeks, trying to um, get an understanding. So it was very it was great to hear you speak about it and to kind of talk through the drawings and to talk through the processes of the work. And, and like Tom said, I think that's definitely where I find my questions that I'm going to ask you now. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about the process. And I think part of my curiosity comes from my contextual position. And as, as a non-European visiting um, European cities, I, 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 you know, over the last few years, I've been very fortunate to travel. Um, and, and again, I just, this is sort of Berlin, uh, Barcelona, uh, 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 <laughs> Lisbon. I'm, I'm always, um, I've always been very uh, curious about what it must be like to be an architect working in, uh, in, in such old cities with the built, uh, the built fabric has been so carefully preserved and there's so many layers to this. And when I think about working in South Africa, you know, we, we kind of, again, like our country as a, as a national project has a 400 year history and the, but the built fabric uh, doesn't speak so much to that. I think it lies in other, um, it lies in other areas that are a lot more intangible. And when they interface with the built environment, that's where these things happen. So I guess my, my, um, my, my questions are, are about you as the designer and where you engage in those moments of the intangible um, and, the, and the kind of tangible built fabric. So the first sort of question that I, I'd like to kind of throw at you is, is around the idea of the representation styles that you showed us tonight. They, they were very mixed. You know, you showed us some very technical drawings, some CAD work, some um, photo collage, some models. And what, what I'm curious is that when you, uh, I guess I'd like to hear a bit more about what was behind the choice that you showed us tonight in terms of the drawings, because sometimes they were very technical like the last project, and sometimes they were very conceptual. And where do you find yourselves uh, exploring these drawings with your own team, with your clients, and with the people that you, that you work with? Uh, well, it's true. The, the drawings are, are very mixed. They are all made here in the office. And uh, sometimes the, the choice for one medium or the other is, uh, sometimes it's obvious. So if you want to build a trim, a roof trim, like, like we showed in the house, well, you need that sort of detailing. So of course you do. And maybe there are a few hand sketches before that or model, uh, model investigations, but it ends up in a technical drawing. And I thought it was worth, worthwhile showing it here because it points your attention to a detail of the architecture. But then, uh, well, the, um, uh, the, foam, the foam model that I showed for New Ghent, also was intentional, uh, well, not, not a very elaborate model because it has been used to talk to people, to try to, to, to gain their confidence and to make clear at a stage where the design is not final and where, where ideas are, uh, are coming up that we can explain to them what it is about or what we think uh, it should be about and to test that out. I was also a more, a larger model that was looking very much the same, but that showed details of how you could enter the houses, how the, uh, how this, uh, what I explained about urban, uh, the urban room, the urban antichambre, and then all these addresses in the continuity around it, uh, where that could be explained. And well, there we found that that, that worked excellently to, to explain to explain the well to, to, to make them understand in which in what ways this would be different. But it was not the first time that these people uh, were entering the process because I must say it was not not my own work. It was uh, Arnold Rendor. As a, as a researcher who was in our team and who did uh, a very thorough of, uh, well, uh, getting acquainted with these people because hardly any information about them 
was was uh, was to be found in the project brief. It was more like, uh, well, of, okay, the, uh, with it, it's social housing. You you know what you can expect, and this area has a bad reputation. So what are you going to do? So so the choice of our team then was that we at least should be able to distinguish what sort of people they were. There were well, many hundreds of them, so we could hardly believe that they would all have the same lives, the same, that they would think on issues on the same way or that. So, so that's what, what we first wanted to, to, to know about, who they actually were. We are not totally sure that they are going to stay in the, or that they are going to be housed in the new buildings as well. But the outset of the building was that, of, of the project was that as many of the people who would like to stay in the area could do so. And well, that's that's why we thought that it, it was important to to uh, to learn to learn to know them. And that's also why there is uh, much difference in the design, because we thought that they were ill-fitted with a design that was uh, the same for all of them. So they could have different, different hopes, different lives, uh, different family sizes as well. Uh, so, so that's why this difference was made also um, well, uh, a feature of of the urban of the urban form and when talking to them we well we, we could find out that they appreciate it and well, an interesting thing about that was actually also that it were it were the, the people who were well who were most uh, well, who had the the most outspoken uh, troubles in life so many of them who had a, a history of addiction or, or uh, of, or of uh, psychic problems uh, that were seen by many of the others to be the troubleshooters in the, in, in the area, that were the ones who were interested and who came to all these meetings. All of them were invited by informal means, so by uh, mostly uh, mouth to mouth, so by, 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 by talking, by uh, house, uh, housekeepers who, who were making them uh, uh, notice that there would be a meeting like that. And the ones who, well, well, who had a more difficult uh, life history than the others, they attended the meetings and they participated very actively in it. And they made drawings to say, yeah, maybe like this, Oh, that's interesting what you are saying there. Uh, is this what you mean? And so that was nice to see that well, for some of them, they don't care if they have only an apartment or whatever apartment or just give them one. And others are really actively concerned with, with the environment that they are going to live in. And then, well, many other forms of drawings we sometimes do renderings, we do. So if uh, the, the client we work for would ask for it or would think it is a, an asset, but we eschew them because we think that a drawing that has a certain form of abstraction that you have to make an effort to see what is on the drawing is a better medium. So because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, appease your, uh, your, your need for imagination. You still have to work with a drawing like that. You still have to try to imagine what is really on the drawing, what is shown here. And so that's why we uh, like them better than the so-called photorealistic uh, image. And then the style... Okay. Reflect that there are many people here. Who when, when, uh, if I may, if I may just make a little in between comment, what I, what I find uh, Paul very interesting in in in, uh, in what you are saying is indeed that let's say the choice for a particular medium 
also seems to depend upon, let's say, the community uh, that you want to address. In the, in the project, in the TAC project, we talk a lot about these communities of tacit knowledge, we call it. And that's, of course, rather different if you're going to address a community of tacit knowledge, which is, which is a community of inhabitants, uh, let's, let's say, as, as you are expressing, where you choose for a particular the model, for instance, as, as you were expressing as well, or if you're maybe, uh, let's say, addressing a community that has more to do with craftsmen that need to make your fine uh, detail. And I think that this is a very yeah, inspiring thing to hear uh, as well. And also, let's say, the capacity as, a, as an architect to be able to, in some kind of way, navigate between these different communities and make your choices according to these different uh, communities, I would, I would say as well, but just as, as, a little, as a little reflection. John, I'm going to give the, the word to you again for the next question. Thank you. That, and, and that's a very, yeah, I think, I think I'm, I'm, again, when, when, when we joined the, the secondment, I find myself being very interested in uh, particularly drawings that I use internally in a practice, because I think those those drawings are often um, much more uh, interesting as artifacts that, that talk about process. And from my own practice experience, um, definitely I'd be curious about the nature of the of the drawings that you that you worked with and that the researcher that you said you worked with use. I think those are those are sort of my, my kind of interesting parts. And and to to sort of lead to my next sort of question, um, I'm, I'm I'm looking at your resumption one that you say half the project is already there, and my interpretation of that is that includes the people that you just spoke about now, um, and I guess I'm curious about the you you, you mentioned that you uh, wanted to engage with the users in that project, um, and that you uh, <clears throat> that you worked with different uh, people to to do that, and you heard from different people. Is this typically something that's in the brief or is this something that you as an office with your collaborators take upon yourselves to engage? And maybe just a bit about um, how or which part of the process is that you like to include people in the process and to which effect? Because I think it's not always about participation throughout the whole thing. I don't believe in that even in my own work. So I'm just uh, interested about your positions around that. Yeah. Um, well, but the, the, the relationship with, with, with the so-called uh, discipline of participation is, is, is an interesting one here. And it's, it's quite, quite difficult because, well, you are not always uh, a lot, or it is not always foreseen in the project or in the process that this would take place. So that can be, uh, that can be uh, a difficulty. And if it is uh, if it is organized, you can find yourself uh, confronted with uh, very outspoken uh, opinions that make you wonder if they are really uh, really re representative for for the whole community. So, well, just to, to mention the. the well, one of these projects that I, that I showed on the slaughterhouse, we were actually interested in the people with their restaurants. So the, the business owners, so small businesses, but they are, well, it's, it's a sort of uh, well-known place in Antwerp that is, of course, in decline now because, well, they, well it's actually a bit of a, a miracle that you can still eat steaks there, but because the slaughterhouse is, 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 is uh, shut it down for such a long time. So we know that these business, businesses are in trouble and they are not the people who are coming to the evening meetings because well, they are running their restaurants, of course. And so, so that, that makes us, but then we think this is what we ourselves should notice as designers. We should okay, we do the participation and we listen to the people who are in the room and we talk to them and sometimes it's very aggressive, but we always ask ourselves, is everybody who, is in, who has an interest in this project, are they all represented? Maybe they are not. Uh, if you say, well, there should be work uh, and uh, a possibility to include work in that site because work, used to be a very important uh, factor in that area and it is not anymore. So, well, with the exception of some of these uh, restaurants, not much work is going on there. 
and an in, and an intention of the brief is that that should be uh, 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 reinstated. Well, then you you can ask yourselves uh, who are the ones who speak up for this part of the project brief. Maybe not the people who are uh, only on the who have only a concern about what what what, what will happen to uh, to what is said. Uh, very very near to their own house so so that's why why we think if if we don't take a stance that this is an important uh, part of the brief and you need a strategic position to make it happen then it is not going to be addressed in the participation talks as well or maybe only in an anecdotal in an anecdotal way so you will not find the empowerment to make it happen just by talking to the people. So that's why we love to talk to the people. Um, I always think that I myself am not that good in it, but there are people around us who, who are really, uh, well, who can really do this and we ask them uh, to do it. But um, what I really insist that we would do is noticing what is happening, even if these people are not in the meetings or come to speak out their minds, still noticing that, that there are possibilities there. So, so that's something that I, that I am always, uh, but that, that, I, that I try to, that I try to include in any of these proce processes, try to understand, uh, uh, if, if uh, well, the client that you are talking with, if he is uh, the full story. So if there are not other, others uh, who are interested, who are involved, who will be touched, uh, are uh, touched by the project, who th th their lives could change uh, through these projects. And if uh, they also have a voice, and if they don't speak for themselves, you can notice by simply seeing more than only what is in the brief. So that's the sort of attitude that we are trying to, to cultivate and that we, we train ourselves in. Jonah, may, may I ask you maybe for, for a last, uh, last uh, question then uh, now, because I think we are, uh, uh, let's say, nearing the, the, the end of the session. We try to, to, try to keep this a bit uh, concise. Sure. I'm going to give you the, the opportunity to ask a last question and then we're slowly concluding. Yeah. Okay, I, I prepared two, but I'll, I'll try and... Uh, <laughs> so, so, Paul, I, I did do a bit, a bit of background reading and, and I was really interested um, in, in two parts of your, of your online presence. One is the teaching course that you were doing at, at, at TU Delft and, and I went through some of your readings. So maybe I'll combine these two questions together. Um, the way that I read your presentation tonight, um, these three positions um, on, or these, these, three, on these three presumptions, to me, that speaks to what you spoke about as your interest in the self-conscious designer. Um, I found that a really interesting part of, of your written work. So I guess in terms of the self-conscious designer, what we saw tonight with these, uh, the, 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 the three positions, and this idea that you talk about architectural culture as a common ground between the professionalization of design and science, I'm just curious as to which of the projects that you showed us tonight maybe speak to what the part that I'm interested in particular is how you see this architectural culture as being this common ground between the design uh, professional and science. Um, yeah. Well, the, the short answer is, well, all of them. But what, what I maybe would like to, to stress that, well, our, our interest in architectural culture is not just for the conscious uh, culture, so so the the, the science architecture, we, we love it. If we would have time for it, I, I would like to speak at great length of, uh, well, many of my heroes, and there are quite a few, but well, what, what is maybe particular in our position is that we, that we take uh, the anonymous architecture you cannot say vernacular because, well, many of, of what, what we have around us, well, could, could not be 
caught with the label vernacular, but it's not always signed. It's maybe not that great, but it, it, uh, it is the, the fabric of what we are living in. And uh, we want to understand both. So the works that are signed and that uh, are the special moments in architecture and also the bulk of what is built. And that is maybe not so great, sometimes troublesome, but also, well, the signed architecture can be troublesome as well. And uh, that is because we, we well, if, if, if these anonymous pieces, uh, if these anonymous pieces of, uh, of uh, architecture uh, uh, are of interest uh, to us, it's because they, they, but they are also made for particular reasons the way they are made. So hence, for instance, are of interest in typology. So like a terraced house, why is it made like that? And what, uh, uh, why are they in some areas uh, this wide and then in others uh, have uh, uh, the, the wide is different and the, the width is different. And, and what does all of that imply for the ways you can use these spaces? So that, that is uh, an interesting topic uh, to us. Um, well, like with the, the, the building that I showed you, the, the, the project that we did with uh, the Verde Vintayur and, and, and EVR for, uh, for hands, unfortunately, it's not going to be built. But where, where we took care of a building that is really hated by all of Ghent, they all, they all think it's, it's it's uh, an abomination, that bunker. And still, if you look at it, it is so, such an interesting facade that you have there. And there, well, the, the, the cultural link that we made of it is one that, uh, that we made to it. It's probably never made by the designers of that building themselves, but we thought of, uh, uh, oh, help me out here, uh, the Brazilian artist, uh, cutting through his canvases. Um, ah, that is getting old, uh, forgetting about names. Um, well, never mind. <laughs> it, it will come to mind after, after we stop the session. But if you see this uh, concrete uh, hung facade with all these cuts through it, it's it's on uh, in an aesthetic level, it's so great. So it's totally fascinating, like, uh, like uh, modern art can be fascinating. And then we take upon us to be the ones who point that out and who say, if you like, uh, if you like the artist, which name is exca escaping me now? Lucia Fontana. Of course, Lucia Fontana, that's the one, yeah. So if you like Fontana and you can you can appreciate that very well, then you should then you should see a Fontana in this facade, in this uh, roughly cut uh, concrete. It's the same sort of uh, aesthetical sensation, and well, and of course then there is the sustainability argument that we are not going to uh, to destroy such an amount of massive concrete to then build. Well, more or less the same, but in a more banal way. That's what that was. What was the that was the challenge of that project uh, for us? Paul and John are, I think, on these I think very compelling reflections on, let's say, architectural culture being a matter of, on the one hand, anonymous architecture, but also of what you call Paul assigned architecture, but maybe also both of these being a matter of tacit knowledge, let's say, that they hold yeah. quite, a bit of, uh, quite a bit of tacit knowledge. I would like to suggest to, to conclude uh, the, the session of, of today. It's, of course, a discussion that we're going to continue. Uh, this was also the, the intention, let's say, of this, uh, of this lecture, to, to get to know each other better, but also to lay the ground for the, for the further discussion. So I wanted to thank both of you. Thank you, Paul Vermeulen. Thank you, John Bennett, for, I think, the very insightful uh, questions. And we are looking forward to continue the discussion with you within the context of the, of the talk. So thanks and have a, have a good evening to all of you. This was nice. Thank you. Bye.